suspects are being one case involves the Disney FBI is now offering a hundred thousand dollars to see if the police are releasing Welcome to Misty Mysteries, a true crime and paranormal podcast. This week is actually a, a two part subject. I will be covering both an unsolved crime and a haunting. It's definitely a case that has movies, shows, and podcasts covering it and remaking it. But today I'm going to be talking about the homicides of Andrew and Abby Borden, or better known as Lizzie Borden. And I do want to warn there is a lot of theories and speculations in this case, so I have tried to keep it to facts. Let's jump right into who Andrew Borden was. Andrew Jackson Borden was born on September 13th, 1822 in Fall Rivers, Massachusetts, to parents Abraham Bowen Borden and Phoebe Borden. He was raised and lived in Fall River for his whole life. Andrew grew up to be an undertaker, but eventually left the business to be a president of a bank and invest in real estate properties. He made a name for himself as one of the wealthiest men in Fall River. He was a husband to both Sarah and Abby, and a father to three girls, Emma, Alice, and Lizzie. Andrew married his first wife, Sarah Anthony Jane Morse, when he was in his 20s around the 1840s. Andrew and Sarah welcomed their first daughter, Emma Eleanor Borden, into the world on March 1st, 1851. Just five years later, their second daughter, Alice Esther Borden, was born on May 3rd, 1856. When Alice was just a year old on March 10th, 1858, she passed away due to dropsy on the brain, or better known as hydrocephalus today, a condition where fluid builds up in the cavities of the brain. Just two years after Alice's death, Lizzie Andrew Borden, Andrew and Sarah's third and final daughter, was born on July 19, 1860. Sadly, when Lizzie was just two years old on March 26, 1863, Sarah passed away from uterine congestion and spinal disease at just 39 years old. Just a few years later, on June 6, 1865, Andrew Borden married his second wife, Abigail Durfee Gray. Abigail was born on January 21st, 1828 in Fall River and, same as Andrew, grew up and lived in the town for her whole life. Abigail was born to parents Oliver Gray and Sarah S. Gray and went by the nickname Abby. Little fact about Andrew and Abby, they were actually fifth cousins, which was not unheard of for this point in history. Different stories paint Abby as a very mean stepmother to Emma and Lizzie. But we don't actually know much about her and the girl's relationship, and some actually even say that she was a very good stepmother to them. Emma was 14, and Lizzie was 5 when Andrew and Abby got married. Andrew and Abby never had any children together, but the girls did grow up with Abby. But as they grew up and Andrew's business grew, he wanted to be closer to his business, and he needed more space. This is why in 1873, he bought a two-tenant home on a piece of land just one block from his business where he built the home we know as the Lizzie Borden house today. This house is a two-story home. On the bottom floor is a front entranceway with stairs leading to the second floor. This front entryway leads to a parlor on the left and a sitting room straight ahead. From the sitting room is a dining room on the left, and the dining room goes into a kitchen and pantry, and just off the kitchen is another entryway that was referred to as the rear entry that leads to the backyard. If you go up the stairs to the second floor, when you first go up into the second floor, there is a guest bedroom that Emma and Lizzie used as a sewing room when there weren't guests there. Then there was Lizzie's room, Emma's room, Andrew and Abby Borden's room. Then there is a second set of staircases that lead to the attic. This was used for storage and has three additional bedrooms. One of these bedrooms is where the Borden's maid, Bridget Maggie Sullivan, lived. If you did notice, I did not mention a bathroom in any of these layouts. This is because Andrew Borden was a rich man, but he did not like to spend his money. He was known as a penny pincher, and he opted out to having electricity and bathrooms in his home, and for a while didn't even have running water. This was not the lifestyle Lizzie wanted to live. She didn't seem to be a fan of it, and she wanted to live in a very rich area of Fall River, called the hills that is made up of the top victorian homes for the wealthy lizzie did not have much of a choice as to where she lived though as a single woman in her 30s for the time she and emma were considered to be 
way past marrying age, and she may not have agreed with how her father wanted to live, but a lawyer of Lizzie's did note that her and Andrew were very close, and Andrew worried a lot for his daughters. If you don't know the story of the Borden family, you don't know why Lizzie had lawyers. Well, on August 4th, 1892, a horrible crime was committed against Andrew and Abby Borden in their family home. But before I go into this crime and what took place that day, I want to take a break to tell you about my sponsor's anchor. Have you heard of Anchor? Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. When I started Misty Mysteries, I didn't know where to go, and Anchor helped me get Misty Mysteries started without charging me an arm and a leg. Anchor is really my suggestion for anyone looking to start a podcast. It has tools that allow you to record and edit in app or on the website. Anchor distributes your podcast on all the listening places such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Good Pods, and all your favorite listening places. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place and best of all it's totally free on anchor fm and on the anchor app thank you to anchor for not only making this podcast possible but for supporting the podcast each week let's hear about what happened on august 4th 1892 that has led to one of the most well-known unsolved cases that oddly enough many people don't know is still an unsolved case During this time, John Morse, Andrew's brother-in-law, and the girl's uncle had been in town visiting. On the morning of August 4th, 1892, at 7 a.m., John, Andrew, and Abby had breakfast together. Shortly after them, Lizzie began to have breakfast, and John Morse left the home around 8.30 a.m., and Andrew left soon after him around 9 to go about his business and check up on rental properties he had. I do want to make a note that the Borden family had been very sick the last few days before this day. They had been sick with nausea and vomiting. In particular, Bridget, Andrew, and Abby had been very sick. The sickness was so bad that Abby went to the family doctor and neighbor, Dr. Michael F. Kelly, on August 3rd, the day before, and told Dr. Kelly that she had been poisoned. Andrew would refuse to see Dr. Kelly because he didn't want to look like a man who would spend his money on such things like doctor visits. Andrew believed that this was a foodborne illness from the way their food had been stored at home, especially since they had been eating leftover mutton. Going back to that morning on August 4th, around 9.30 after eating, even though her and Abby had both been sick, Abby sent Bridget outside to clean the windows, while Abby herself went upstairs to clean the guest bedroom. Lizzie had finished eating, and she went into the sitting room to iron handkerchiefs. Around 10.45 a.m., Andrew came back from business to the house, and Bridget had to let him in through the front entrance. The front door had three locks. Two could have been unlocked from outside, but one could only be unlocked from inside the home for security reasons. Normally, Lizzie left this unlocked for Andrew. That morning, she didn't, and we aren't exactly sure why, but Bridget does recall believing she heard Lizzie laughing upstairs while she struggled to unlock the door for Andrew. Despite this struggle with the door, Andrew got inside his home and Lizzie came to greet him. She let him know that Abby had left to see a friend after receiving a letter that they hadn't been feeling good. She helped her father take off his boots and he laid down on the sitting room couch at 11 a.m. to take a nap. Bridget went upstairs at that same time and took a nap in her bedroom. Just 15 minutes later, at 11.15, Bridget woke up from her nap to Lizzie yelling to her for help. Someone had come in and attacked Andrew. Lizzie sent Bridget to go get the neighbor, Dr. Kelly, and Lizzie's friend, Alice Russell. When Dr. Kelly and Alice came into the sitting room where Lizzie now was, they saw Andrew lying on the couch where he had been napping, covered in blood. 69-year-old Andrew Borden was deceased by the time they came. He had been struck in the face and head 11 times with an axe. Another neighbor on the scene and Bridget then went upstairs where they found Abby lying face down in a puddle of blood next to the bed in the guest room. 63-year-old Abby Borden was also deceased by the time she was found. Abby had been struck in the back of her head 18 times. 
When police arrived at the scene of the Borden home, they started to take crime scene photos. They are actually some of the earliest crime scene photos and can still be seen not only on the internet, but in the Borden's home. The police had first thought that the murder of Andrew and Abby Borden was done by an intruder in the home, but while investigating the home, they had felt from observing Lizzie that she was way too calm for someone who had just found her father dead. Little physical evidence was found in the home, but they did find two key pieces to the case. The first being that Abby had been murdered before Andrew. Based on how Abby's blood had clotted, it's believed Abby was killed between 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. Andrew's blood had still been dripping and had no signs of clotting, which puts his death shortly before Lizzie had found him. The second key evidence was the finding of what they believe to this day is the murder weapon. In the basement was an axe head missing the wooden handle. Police had also found a bucket of bloody rags in the basement, but Lizzie was on her menstrual cycle and this and her menstrual cycle was confirmed by her doctor who had been treating her for pain related to it. Without the modern day period products we have today, rags are very commonly used as sanitary products. For this reason, it was believed that these rags were period products and they were not suspicious. Police believed whoever committed these crimes had to have been in the house for 90 minutes between the murder of Abby and Andrew and had a hard time believing no one could have seen this person going into the home, waiting in it, or leaving it as it is a small home. It had no hallways. You had to walk through rooms to get to other rooms. When Abby was murdered, Bridget had been outside washing the windows. Emma had been out of town visiting a friend for days at this point and wasn't due back for a few more days. And John Morse had been in a streetcar with six priests on his way to visit other family. His story, as odd as it sounds, has been confirmed by these priests he was in the streetcar with, that he was on his way to go visit family. One thing people do find odd about John, though, is the night of the murders, after Abby and Andrew had been moved from the crime scene to the kitchen table where the doctor did perform their postmortems, John slept in the room where Abby's blood was still on the carpet. But with the solid alibi, this really is just added up to an odd behavior. With everyone else having alibis, the math adds up to just Lizzie and Abby being in the home when Abby was murdered. If they don't suspect an intruder and Lizzie was the only one in the home with Abby, the police began to suspect Lizzie Borden for the crime. They already thought she was too calm after finding her father dead. Police began to question Lizzie, and when they first questioned her, she told police during the time of the murders, she had been in the barn looking for fishing weights, but where she was changed a few more times, and she seemed very confused. Then, a local drugstore clerk told the police that the day before the murder, he had seen a woman who looked like Lizzie, or could have been her, come into his store asking for percussive acid to use for cleaning. The substance can be a lethal poison and needs to be prescribed by a doctor. This is why the clerk denied her purchase. Alice Russell also had a story for the police as well. On the night of Sunday, August 7th, 1892, the day after Andrew and Abby's funeral in the Borden home, Alice told police she had saw Lizzie burning a dress covered in paint in the kitchen's wood-burning stove. On August 11th, 1892, after these witnesses and Lizzie being questioned, the police arrested Lizzie and charged her for the murder of her father and stepmother, Andrew and Abby. Lizzie was held for 10 months before the trial began, and the media was all over this case and the trial. People took sides before the trial even began. Some believe Lizzie could never have done something like this, while others swore she did it. On June 5th, 1893, what the media named the trial of the century started, and people were lined up trying to get seats inside the courtroom. On the first day of the trial, the prosecution started off by showing the actual skulls of Abby and Andrew Borden in the courtroom to show the damage the axe had done. When Lizzie saw the skulls, she fainted, and this caused many people to gain sympathy for Lizzie. Lizzie only ever said one thing during her two-week trial. She told the courtroom, I am innocent. I leave it to my counsel to speak for me. Lizzie's defense team did not take a traditional approach to the trial. They didn't come up with other theories or what could have happened. Instead, all they needed to do was poke holes into the prosecution's evidence. First, her defense had Lizzie's doctor testify that she had been on morphine as it was the only painkiller available 
for the pain from her menstrual cycle while she was being questioned by the police, which her being on morphine could have caused confusion and memory loss for Lizzie. The questioning was thrown out in court after this came out. When it came to the two witnesses, the local drugstore clerk never testified in court, and Alice Russell's story was confirmed that Lizzie burnt a dress, but Emma Borden took the stand to tell the court that burning dresses was a normal thing in the Borden household. Emma essentially raised Lizzie since she was so young when their mother passed away. Emma taught Lizzie to burn dresses when she was done using them. The prosecution then suggested that no blood could have been found on her dresses because Lizzie was naked when she committed the crimes, but they were basically laughed out of court with this suggestion, as Lizzie was seen as a good Christian woman. She taught Sunday school, worked for a Christian society, gave baskets to the poor, and made meals for children on Christmas. It also came out the axe head believed to be the murder weapon had been sent to Harvard University, but no blood was found on the wood that was left over from the handle, and no trace of blood was found on the metal of the axe head. Without the wood handle, not much could have been done besides showing the axe inside the skulls of Abby and Andrew. The stomachs of Abby and Andrew were also sent away with no signs of poisoning. Lizzie's defense seemed to poke enough holes in the case. After just two weeks on trial and 90 minutes of deliberation from the 12-man jury, Lizzie Borden was announced to be not guilty. Lizzie hid her face as some cried tears of joy while others felt she had gotten away with murder. The New York Times wrote, It will be of certain relief to every right-minded man and woman who has followed the case that the jury out of New Bedford has not only acquitted Miss Lizzie Borden of this atrocious crime with she was charged with, but has done so with promptness that was very significant. After she was released, Lizzie changed her name to Elizabeth. She bought a new house in the hills, the upper-class neighborhood I mentioned earlier, this home had everything she ever wanted, all the amenities, running water, electricity, and even four bedrooms. She lived there with her sister Emma and loved the home so much she named it Maplecroft. Lizzie bought a car with a driver who would take her to New York where she could go to the theater and throw extravagant parties. Her car even came with special seats for her four Boston Terriers. Though she finally had the life she wanted before her father and stepmother's death, Emma had moved out of the home without any reasoning. Lizzie was still outcasted in the town. No one really wanted to sit with her in church. Children told stories of her making up a playground rhyme or nursery rhyme that went, Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. The children threw eggs and rocks at her home. To this day, many people still believe that she got away with murder. Lizzie died in her home on June 1st, 1927, at 66 years old. Emma died shortly after, on June 10th, 1927, at 76 years old. The Borden family is buried in the Oak Grove Cemetery in Fall River. You can find a stone with the initials AJ for Andrew Borden, and on this stone lists all of his daughters. Buried next to the stone is Emma, Lizzie, under her new name, Lisbeth, Andrew, Alice, Abby, and Sarah. Andrew, all of his wives, and all of his daughters laid a rest in a little private section of the cemetery. To this day, you can visit their resting place for yourself, and the cemetery even has arrows that bring you to their graves. For Lizzie, she got to live out the rest of her life and even be buried with her family, but Andrew and Abby, their murders, will sadly always remain a cold case. This hasn't stopped people from trying to solve Andrew and Abby's case. There are a number of theories out there, but I'm going to tell you just the most popular ones. First and most popular always goes back to Lizzie. She was found not guilty by the law, but many believe that she had the means and the motives to kill Andrew and Abby. Money, for the most, was always a motive. Abby's sister and Andrew's sister-in-law had been living in a home that she was going to be evicted from. Andrew stopped this eviction by adding her home to his list of many real estate properties, but for this one, he didn't keep the property. He signed it over to Abby to watch over it and take care of her sister. When Lizzie and Emma got word of Andrew signing a property over to Abby, they started to worry that if Andrew passed away before Abby, she was going to get all of their inheritance, and when Abby passed away, they would lose it all to Abby's sister. The girls were not happy about this. 
Lizzie started to separate herself from her family, having meals at different times as everybody else, and spending time outside the home. Resentment towards her father and stepmother, and the want for that money, could have built up, worried she was going to lose everything, she may have committed the crimes for this reason. Then we have Bridget, who was at the home the day of the crimes. A theory that has been thrown around is that the already sick Bridget had a breakdown while cleaning the windows in the heat outside. She went inside the home and committed the crimes during this breakdown. Or a very popular one, especially in movies and TV, is that Bridget and Lizzie had been partners. During this time, same-sex couples were not allowed. One of the Borden parents may have found the couple out and in hopes to keep their secret private, Bridget and Lizzie worked together to take the lives of Andrew and Abby. After Lizzie Borden was acquitted of the crimes and she bought her new home, Maplecroft, Bridget left for Canada and was never seen again by the Bordens. It is also believed that she could have been able to afford to move to Canada and buy the home she bought because John Morse may have paid off his alibis and paid off Bridget to keep quiet for the crimes that he committed. Then we have a possible intruder in the home. A neighbor of the Bordens did tell the police that she had seen a man who looked very angry knocking on the Borden family door that day. Did this Mr. Man possibly have motive to kill Abby and Andrew on August 4th? Or one very popular theory, did Andrew Borden possibly have a son outside of his marriages? And when he came knocking and trying to blackmail Andrew and Andrew refused, in retaliation, he may have murdered Andrew and Abby. So what do you think? Do you think Lizzie is innocent or do you think she committed these crimes? Who do you think may have committed these crimes? I'd love to hear your opinions on Missy Mystery social media, but if you want to learn more, I'd love to suggest a video I saw while doing my research. I watched a video from the Smithsonian YouTube channel that tests blood patterns, weapons, and really deep dives into the case. Or, if you are more of a hands-on learner, the Borden family home is now a museum and a bed and breakfast. While visiting, you can learn all about the crimes, see movie props, see the family photos, and maybe even see a spirit of one of the Borden family members, which I'm going to tell you all about in next week's episode of Misty Mysteries. For now, I want to thank you for listening to this episode. Please stay hydrated out there, stay safe, relax, and I will see you next week.